Hey everyone, I just played Hitman Codename 47 and I'm going to talk about it a lot because I don't know what a sunk cost fallacy is. But before I get my hands into the guts of this game, I'd like to answer a quick question. You might be wondering why I'm playing the game in 4x3 when widescreen mods for this exist. And the reason is I have a friend who will be ecstatic that this video exists, but furious that it's in for free, and I live for his pain. Also, if you enjoy the review, please consider liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing. Anyway, let's get to it. I have a complicated relationship with Hitman Codename 47. The first game in IO Interactive's long-running stealth series released on PC in 2000, but I didn't play it for the first time until 2016, and I hated it. A friend of mine once told me that I go through video games like a bulldozer, and while I do try my best to explore everything a game has to offer whenever I sit down to play one, I can't honestly fault the assessment. So let's just do it! Bulldoze right through this beautiful trash level by level, before getting into a critique of its mechanics and systems. The game begins- whoa, hang on. Let me just change these rancid controls. There we go. The game begins with a short tutorial that in my opinion does a bad job of preparing the player for the actual game. The focus here is on traversal and combat, which is odd because you only need the special movements once or twice in the entire game, and if you find yourself in a firefight, odds are you've already resigned yourself to restarting the level anyway. You are given instructions on how to use your assassin's tools like the garrot, the knife, and disguises, but only the last of them is tutorialized in any meaningful way. There's no dummy target you have to sneak up to past some guards and shank, it's just standing there in the middle of the room. As for the disguise tutorial at the end of the level, it's done by trial and error. You either kill the orderly and take his clothes to get through the door, or you don't. You only learn you've screwed up once you've already failed, and Hitman Codename 47 doesn't believe in second chances. The last thing I have to say about this tutorial is that it's very linear. It's also the only linear level in the game, and it just feels like a chore to play, especially with the constant commentary from Dr. Ortmeier. You are doing very well. Dr. Ortmeier loves the sound of his own voice. He's also the main villain, and if this is somehow still a surprise to you at this point... Spoilers? Look, this game does have a story, but it's just an excuse to give context to the various missions. I'll talk about it a little toward the end of the video, but it's nothing to write home about. You could remove the interlude cutscenes and nothing would really change. In fact, you could say this game is about one man's desperate search for a clean bathroom, and I'd believe you. I need to use the bathroom. The first level, Kowloon Triads in Gang War, who came up with this? The first level, Kowloon Triads in Gang War, does a much better job at showing the player what the game will actually be like and easing them into that gameplay loop than the tutorial does. The map is relatively small, the objectives are clear, and there's a lot of room for experimentation by first time players. It's also extremely simple, to the point where it can be completed with one bullet and within five minutes if you know what you're doing. Its brevity works well in its favour. Even if a first time player stumbles a few times working out what to do, the level is so short that it doesn't feel like a massive loss of progress when a failure does happen. It's a good opening mission, I have no complaints. The second level, Ambush at Wangfao Restaurant, what are these names? Ups the complexity without overwhelming the player. The aim here is to... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. Anyway, the aim here is to kill all the blue gangsters with a car bomb. Once again the level is relatively small, and the time it takes to complete relatively short, so any failure here only sets the player back 5-10 minutes. It's another good opportunity for experimentation and familiarisation with the controls and mechanics. Agent 47 can't approach the vehicle in his suit, so he needs to kill the driver, preferably without being seen by a civilian. Uh oh. Once disguised, he can plant the bomb right under the guard's nose and escape. Just make sure to ditch the driver's outfit before everyone comes back to the car. Hey, that's not the driver. Cowabunga it is. Yeah, this run did not go well. There's an added bit of complexity in timing the bomb to go off so it takes out all the blue guards in one go. But again, a failure here doesn't cost too much. Also, this can happen. Yeah, we take those. Level 3, The Massacre at Chung Chow Fish Restaurant- Okay, these names are like newspaper headlines, they're so anemic. Level 3 continues the gradual escalation of complexity and difficulty. The map is a little bit larger and the objectives are a little bit more complex, but the level can still be completed within 10 to 15 minutes, so once again a failure isn't a huge loss. But more importantly, this level has the most iconic line in the entire franchise. I need to use the bathroom. Like the last level, you need a disguise to get close to your target, but it also requires some preparation and time management to pull off. If you don't leave a silenced gun behind in the iconic bathroom before prancing off to get the disguise, you might as well just restart, as I discovered on this failed run. So there you are. Let me just take your weapons. 
No. I knew there was a reason we went into the bathroom. You need to be quick too, because this guy will beeline for the restaurant when he spawns in. It's a rare moment where the game encourages haste rather than forcing you to wait. Greetings, fellow gangsters. I'm definitely not a hitman. The hardest part is hiding the body of the man whose clothes you need before anyone sees- uh, Oh, hello, officers. The perfect crime? Once that's done, it's just a matter of shooting the police chief through the bathroom door, leaving evidence that the red gangsters did it and then bolting for the level exit. This one took me a few tries. There are a lot of ways to fail and a lot of variables to keep in mind, both of which are only going to increase as the game goes on. If the game hasn't clicked for you by now, it's not going to, because the next level remains to this day one of the highest spikes in difficulty I've ever seen in a video game. I need to use the bathroom. I see. Level 4, The Lee Hong Assassination. The real hitman starts here. The mission takes place in Lee Hong's restaurant, which sits on top of a maze of underground tunnels, hides a labyrinthine brothel on the upper floors, and also includes his personal and very well-guarded villa on the other side of a garden. Lee Hong spends most of the mission safe in his villa, and getting past his guards or luring him out is an exercise in frustration. The main issue is his henchman, who will see through any disguise you happen to be wearing if you try to infiltrate the villa head on. Yeah, this run did not go well. To get past him you need poison. This man has poison, but he's only willing to give it to you in exchange for a jade statue. Where's the jade statue? In a safe. One of three safes, which are randomised for each playthrough. To get the code and the right safe you need to save two NPCs. A woman forced into prostitution in the brothel called Lei Ling, and Mr. America here held captive down in the underground tunnels. To get to Lei Ling you need an invitation to the brothel, talking to yellow man or green man about Asia's finest delicacies. I know exactly what you mean, sir. Points you to the bartender, who will give you an invitation, allowing you past Triangle Head and upstairs. Talk to the madam, follow Lei Ling to her room, have a chat, escort her over the roof and out the door, and now you have the code. To get the location of the right safe you need a disguise. Steve here will do, hide him in the bathroom. Steve? Oh, what are you doing, Steve? Now you need access to the underground tunnels. They're in the kitchen. Eventually you'll find a guarded door. The guard is rude. Kill him. Inside you find Mr. America. I'm sure he'll be fine. Now you have the code and the location of the right safe. You better hope it's not this one or this one or in about a minute you're gonna have to restart the level and do all of this again. Got the statue? Give it to the man. He gives you poison. Poison sockets are full of poison. The poison needs to go in Lee Hong's meal. I hope you killed Green Man or Yellow Man earlier in the level because the chef won't let you near the food without their disguise and Lee Hong is now on his way into the restaurant meaning you have no time left to actually go and murder them. Bring Lee Hong the food. The henchman eats it instead. Lee Hong bolts. You kill the henchman. Cutscene over. You are now holding a gun. If you don't holster the gun the second the cutscene ends your disguise will be blown the guards come running and you will have to do all of this again. Get a villa guard's disguise, wander lost through the underground tunnels until you find the right elevator up to the villa and proceed to Lee Hong's office but don't let him see you because then your disguise will be blown and you'll have to do all of this again. Hide in the corner and shoot him, holster your gun before a guard comes to investigate because they're so dumb as rock stupid they won't put together that you killed their boss unless you're holding a weapon. You might think that's the end of the level but you still have to make your way down to this speedboat to escape the villa. Then at last you can breathe easy. You did it. Congratulations. The Lee Hong assassination is a serious test of the player's skills. The three previous levels might as well have been tutorials for how vast a jumping difficulty and complexity there is between them and this mission. Where the previous levels might take 15 to 20 minutes at most if you don't know what you're doing, this level can take up to 40 or 50 even if you do know what you're doing. And if you go in blind, you're going to be here for a long time. Admittedly, you aren't sent in blind. The mission briefing does give the player some hints as to where to find Mr. America and how to acquire the poison, but most of the progress here will be achieved through trial and error, which wouldn't be such a problem if the game didn't lack any kind of save system. I wasn't kidding when I said earlier if you fumble part of the mission you'd have to do all of it again from the very beginning. You have one shot at this one shot. If you screw up at any point, you are not getting a second chance. This was not a huge problem in the earlier levels, but it becomes a major problem here and gets even worse as the game goes on. But I'll discuss my issues regarding the save system or lack thereof later. Right now we have an Al Pacino wannabe to kill. If the Lee Hong assassination was an exercise in complex environmental game design, level 5, Find the Yua Tribe, is the complete opposite. The level is a vast expanse of green nothing, mostly filled with identical trees and the occasional guard patrol. And even with the map, compass and knowledge of some landmarks, it can be very easy to get lost. That's not to say there's nothing to find here. There's a crashed plane, a river patrolled by a helicopter, an outpost of guards, a bunch of ancient statues that I think point toward a hidden village of Native Americans, at least one dropped crate filled with assault rifle ammo, and there's also a dirt road that leads to a hole in reality. I wonder. But between all of that, there's just nothing but trees. 
which I know is the point of a jungle. But even if you know where you're going, it can still take up to five minutes to travel across the map as the crow flies. And if you're really lost, you run the risk of wandering right out of Hitman Codename 47 and into Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb. This map is just so big. Hang on. You're on a time limit too. One of the objectives is to recover the villager's idol from the crashed plane, and if you spend too long wandering lost in the jungle, eventually a patrol of guards will reach the crash site and make the level that much harder to complete. The time they take to reach the crash site is inconsistent too. On my main run for this video, it took them around 20 minutes, but when I jumped back in to get some extra footage after beating the game, it only took them 5. This may be because I killed these two in my main run, I'm not sure. Hang on. Once you do return the idol to the tribe, aside from getting this, uh choice bit of storytelling. The village leader tasks you with rescuing his brother from Dunkachino's soldiers. And he is, you guessed it, on the other side of the map. <sighs> Hang on, I'll be back in five minutes. Hang on. Now you could find some stealthy way to rescue this guy and escort him back home. Or you could completely screw it up like I did, get killed, respawn at the village and wait for the leader's brother to run all the way back on his own. Very slowly. This is only about a quarter of the time I spent waiting for him, by the way. And I still sped it up by 500%. Thank God. Oh. I'm never getting that gun back, am I? Well, <laughs> Level 6, the Jungle God, is the easiest level in the game, because all you have to do is run to the exit and hope you don't get killed before you reach it. That's it. Level 7, say hello to my little friend- really? They actually called it that. Level 7, Say Hello to My Little Friend, by contrast, is one of the hardest levels in the game, although it's not the worst. Those of you who've played this game already know what I'm talking about and are rubbing your hands in anticipation, but that's for a later chapter of this video. Let me give you a taste of what my experience with level 7 was like. Yeah, this one was rough. The gaming gods must have known I brute forced level 6 and sent this hell to punish me. The worst part is, this level isn't even all that complex compared to something like the Lee Hong assassination. It's just long. Very. Very. Long. Ignoring everything else going on in this level for a moment, regardless of your strategy here, you will need to do this walk of shame every single time you play this mission. Because there is no other way into the compound, and again, this is sped up by 500%. Running for several minutes before you even get the chance to make another attempt at whatever part of the level you stuffed up gets old real fast. Let's look at the objectives. The two main goals here are to kill Dunkachino and blow up his drug lab. But whether you confront Dunkachino in one of the game's rare boss fights or pop him with a sniper rifle from afar, you still need to get into his office to get the bomb with which to destroy the lab. That means getting past these guards, who sometimes don't realise you're murdering them one by one, even as you hold the bloody knife up to their faces, and other times don't realise that walls exist and can see you from the other side of the goddamn building. But they are nothing compared to the guards around the lab, who will sometimes just decide to shoot you, even if you've made it through the rest of the level without being noticed. 
I still do not understand why sometimes they would let me through, and other times they would just start blasting. It didn't matter if I'd ended up shooting every guard in the house or left them alone, whether I'd shot Dunkachino from afar or got up in his face, whether I'd walked across the compound or ran at a sprint, it felt completely up to chance whether these assholes would let me progress. I mean, look at this! Ain't another blade, you gonna die! And every time they did decide to send me back to the start, I had to do that bloody walk back into the compound. Even when the guards at the lab did deign to let me pass, these guys at the plane still got me once. Yes, once. I made damn well sure that never happened again. And you better too if you ever play this game yourself, because there's no other way to exit the level. You can't sneak back through the jungle god's lair. You fly, or you die. This level is tedious, it's frustrating, and it's just not fun. When I failed in previous levels, for the most part it felt like it was my fault. I'd forgotten to properly prepare, or I didn't take something into account, or I got impatient and moved too quickly, but here it felt like it was the game just being temperamental. It's garbage, but thankfully the next mission is much better. How can I help you, sir? I need to use the bathroom. Mm, no, I'm sorry. I don't think so. Level 8, Traditions of the Trade, is probably the closest Hitman Codename 47 gets to the heights of the series' most recent installments, the World of Assassination trilogy. There's no more jungle, just a hotel in Budapest, one that you can even visit in real life, and a target to kill. And get this, you can even make it look like an accident. The hotel is a sprawling maze of stairs and metal detectors, meaning you can't bring in any of your normal equipment. Everything you need has to be found on site, and there is a surprising amount of weaponry to be found here. The guards have sidearms of course, but you can find a silenced pistol in a guarded room you need to sneak inside, and even acquire a shotgun from the hotel's florist if you know how to get his attention. This part's always confused me, why does a florist have a shop in a hotel? This level is also the only time in the entire game you'll ever need to use all of the traversal mechanics introduced in the tutorial to succeed. Amazing. The map can seem overwhelming at first, but there's only a handful of locations you need to travel between and most of them are quite close together. But if you do wander off the beaten path, god help you, because this hotel will consume you. The first objective of this level is to kill Dr. Fuchs, which is, for a change, a fairly simple affair. He's constantly wandering in and out of the sauna in the baths, all you need to do is follow him in, turn up the heat, and you're golden. You don't even need to go and speak to his secretary to learn this, although you can, which is a nice touch. The second objective is to rescue a nuclear bomb from Dr. Fuchs's office, which is easy enough to sneak into. Or not. To get it out of the hotel you need a special suitcase to transport it without getting noticed. The suitcase is located in the hotel room of Dr. Fuchs's brother, who, surprisingly, you don't actually have to kill to complete the level. I did though. Don't make the same mistake I did. Bring suitcase and bomb together, and voila! Now all you have to do is walk out the front door without passing any metal detectors along the way, and the level's over. I love how silly this cutscene is, just imagining all the stealth and spycraft that went into the mission itself, and then ending it by jumping into a getaway limo is hilarious. I'd like to imagine it's 47's handler Diana behind the wheel too. Traditions of the Trade is like a breath of fresh air after the previous level. It's not too long, it's not too complicated, there are multiple ways to succeed on top of a bunch of easter eggs to find if you take the time to explore, and best of all there aren't any instant fail conditions you can unwittingly stumble into. It's a good level, the best that the game has to offer, and it's unsurprising that its influence can be felt echoing down through the franchise in future entries. Hi, I'm Sandy. What can I do for you? I need to use the bathroom. Which brings me to level 9. Gunrunner's Paradise. Hope you like trains. I wonder if the car glitch works here too. Hell yeah it does. This is another mission that has no assassination target. The aim here is to replace a gunrunner during an arms deal with the Mad Hatter of all people to get the location of your next victim. Like the Colombian levels, the map is a sprawling jungle, just exchange trees for concrete buildings and the occasional runaway train. Without the inbuilt map, this level would be a nightmare. Your first stop, after stealing this guy's life and then his clothes, is a bar where a pair of arms dealers are relaxing before the meeting with Jarvis Tetch. You need to attach a tracking device to their car so you can follow them to the meeting place, which means you can't kill them. Instead you talk to the bartender, get a favour from a local dancer, get her to give the car's guard a good time as a distraction, and plant the bug on the car while they're off playing on a Christian Minecraft server. When they're done, follow the car from the bar to the meeting place. But wait, there's no way in. The compound is completely walled off. What are you supposed to do now? So you remember that train that's just been flying around the level? You need to switch the tracks so that it chugs straight through the wall of the compound in order to get in. Hope you notice these things on your way over. At least you can always find the train on your map. 
Once inside, you have to fight your way through some dogs and then a warehouse full of gangsters and then hide the bodies before the Mad Hatter arrives because he's a... <laughs> a tetchy guy. Oh, and don't forget to retrieve the bug on the car. Lassie, no! Because you need the bug to put in the case of money you're handing over in the deal. Do all that, and you can go ahead with the meeting. At which point the level is over. Unless you're me, where this random guy I couldn't even see through the draw distance started shooting at me from outside the warehouse, causing the Mad Hatter to call off the meeting even though it had already happened and the mission to fail despite me having met the win conditions, which meant I had to do the entire level again from scratch. Yeah, I was not happy. But I'll save my thoughts on that bullshit for the discussion on the game mechanics. For now let's keep going because there is a lot to talk about with the next mission. Level 10, Plutonium Runs Loose, is one of the worst levels in any video game I have ever played, and that is not hyperbole. Ask any diehard Hitman fan what their least favourite level is and Plutonium Runs Loose will come up every time. The level combines all the worst aspects of this game and blends them together into a slurry of garbage that it forces you to drink drop by drop. It's... Oh, oh no, is that royalty-free classical music I hear? No! <laughs> Yeah, this level sucks. And the main reason for that is because it's so incredibly long. This map is huge and you're forced to travel the entire way across it on the game's terms in order to pick up a car bomb before you even get the chance to make an attempt on infiltrating the cargo ship where the target is actually hiding. First you have to get a disguise. Be careful though because sometimes this guy will just know you're there and start blasting. And sometimes his friend will notice and end things before they even begin to. If you get past these two and rush to the guarded gate fast enough, well done. You can continue without having to wait for another guard to walk cycle back to open the gate for you. Because even though you have the right disguise, you don't have the right to pass through the gate. And if you miss the window, buckle up because you're going to be standing here for a long time. But assuming you get past that, you can finally make a straight run to the car bomb. The footage you're watching right now is my successful run. I've sped up the time spent only running by 500%. You can bypass the guards without issue, but the dogs will attack on sight. And once you enter Dogtown, you'd better hope you're out of earshot of any of the wandering guards. Kill all the dogs and you can finally get the car bomb and actually start the level. Now imagine having to do this every time you fail. Or in this level's case when the game decides you fail because it's a botched mess of instant fail traps. Now imagine going into this level blind without knowing there are hidden doorways in the fences to bypass the guarded gates. Because there are other guarded gateways and the game will make you wait on each and every one of them. And sometimes you'll be left waiting forever because as soon as you pick up the car bomb, the guard who walks through the gates between the docked ship and the truck filled with weapons ceases to exist. Your only option at this point is to kill the guards watching the gates from afar with a sniper rifle. All four of them. And the two other guards on nearby roofs who will shoot on sight if they see you even looking at those gates the wrong way. This is only one layer of bullshit this mission lathers onto the cake of feces. The next is that it spawns in a new guard not far from the truck where you find the car bomb, and if he catches you carrying the sniper rifle to deal with the guards watching the gates, he will open fire. The game never tells you that he's coming. He just materialises out of the draw distance like a trial and error demon. There is a special place in hell reserved for the developer who put this guard into the game. 
Once you get past all of that, the real mission starts. I know it feels like I've said that several times now, but it's true. Everything before this point in the mission is just preamble to the main event. If you're going to use the car bomb, and after going to all that effort to pick it up, why wouldn't you? You need to take out all the guards around not only the car, but the boat. Because if any of them see or hear or just decide they know something's wrong, they will run to the boat to alert the target. Once that happens, he sets the nuclear bomb on board to explode and bolts for the car. If you haven't planted your own little explosive surprise in his car by then, you might as well restart because there's no chance you're going to kill him and everyone else on the boat in time to defuse the nuke in the cargo hold before it goes off. And that's assuming you don't get turned into Swiss cheese by the amount of guards watching both vehicles. Once you plant the bomb, you also need a new disguise because the mercenaries guarding the dock aren't allowed on board the ship. Take out Mr. Turtleneck over here and you finally have access to the boat. At this point, there's only one thing left to do. Murder everyone- what? It just crashed. It actually just crashed. Fuck! Hang on. I know how to beat this level. Hang on. There we go. And done. There. We did it, everyone. We beat the level. Yeah, needless to say, after hours of trying and failing to get on board the ship, I was not happy. But thankfully, the next run I did was the successful one. At this point, there's nothing to do but murder the crew and get to the nuke once Boris makes a run for it. Which sounds simple on paper, but the ship is a maze and it's still filled with enemies, so there's still a good chance you'll fail. You can see me desperately searching for the bomb here. I really had no idea where I was going. This is one of the most satisfying cutscenes in any video game. If you haven't played it, you don't even know. The last thing to do once you've defused the bomb is to guide the ship out of port. Again, it sounds simple, but as one last fuck you to the player, the first time you try a final guard spawns in to shut down the ship's engines, meaning another trek back down into the maze to deal with him, and the possibility of death, because he is, of course, armed. I would show you footage of it, but for whatever reason it didn't happen on this playthrough. Not that I'm complaining. I guess it decided to go easy on me after the crash incident. This level is bad. Even just watching the edited footage back months after the actual playthrough makes me feel exhausted. Words don't do it justice, you really have to experience it firsthand to understand just how bad it is. My opinion of the game went up between playthroughs, which I'll get into detail about a bit later, but Plutonium Runs Loose remains one of the worst things I've ever played, and I am very glad I will never have to play it again. Level 11, the setup, is the game's penultimate mission, and the last one to focus on stealth. From the docks of Rotterdam, we travel to a Romanian mental institute, although it skews closer to the old-fashioned ideas of a 19th century insane asylum rather than any sort of modern medical facility. The asylum, like all the larger buildings in the game, is a maze, and the main obstacle here more than any orderly. Your goal, at first, is to find Dr. Kovacs and revoke his medical license and also his life, but things are not so simple. As the name of the level implies, this mission is a setup. Upon finding Dr. Kovacs, the asylum is raided by a team of Special Forces police officers. When the cutscene ends, Dr. Kovacs is simply gone. He is never seen or heard from again. The goal now is to escape without drawing the attention of the orderlies or the cops. As long as you have an orderly's disguise by this point, it won't be a problem. When the cops aren't glitching into each other in doorways, they'll just ignore you as they choo-choo train through the halls of the asylum. You could try shooting them, but why bother when they're not a threat? You can't buy extra weapons or ammo in the shop before starting the level either, so that's even less incentive to shoot your way out. You can find guns in and around the asylum, but they're really not worth it. As long as you look the part, the cops will let you pass. Getting out is easier said than done though, because like I said, this place is a maze and many of its halls and corridors look the same. I only figured out where to go by stumbling into the right room. It's here you'll find Mr. America again, and after this very awkwardly framed conversation, he'll take you to the level exit. Very slowly. I believe you can also complete the level by giving a teddy bear to one of the patients, but I never tested to find out. Thus begins the final level of Hitman Codename 47, Meet Your Brother. Instead of a stealth-based gauntlet through an underground lab to take out Dr. Ortmeier, remember him from the tutorial? It's a combat-focused cat-and-mouse hunt through a concrete maze. The smirking Agent 48s are the cats, and you are most definitely the mouse. Although, that's assuming you can even reach the start of the boss fight. Yeah, that was not my finest moment. 
Moving on. This boss fight is bad for several reasons, not least of which is that the game takes away any armor you happen to find in the setup when you spawn in, but I'll save the others for when I talk about the mechanics. Another big problem is that you have to listen to Altmaier monologue over the fight for what feels like an hour, and the dialogue is... pretty bad. This is also the only level to boot you to the main menu when you die, which means if you're not careful you can delete your save file like I almost did. If that had happened, this video would not exist. But once the 48s are dead, you can head on into Wartmeyer's lab, shoot him in the head, and the game is over. There's no epilogue, no Dane and more, the game simply ends. Congratulations. The nightmare is over. It sure was. Okay, let's pivot. So given what you've seen, it would be safe to say that I found Hitman Codename 47 to be an infuriating experience. And I did, when I first played it. My first playthrough of Codename 47 back in 2016 was done with a friend, a guy who knew the series back to front and was basically my guide. It was also one of the worst gaming experiences I've ever had and instantly cemented Codename 47's place in my mind as one of the worst games ever made. I hated everything about it. I hated the lack of a save system, I hated the way the game played dirty, I hated the sheer size of some of the levels, I hated the way the game just expected you to know things about itself that you couldn't possibly know, but most of all I hated the waiting. The endless waiting. The counting the seconds can feel my cells dying non-stop due to chop cheese grating waiting. There were things to like about it, things I still like, but for a guy who goes through games like a bulldozer it's safe to say Hitman Code Name 47 was not the game for me. I couldn't understand how anything so bad could actually get a sequel. And yet, when I went to replay the game for this video, I didn't find it nearly as insufferable. There were moments of intense frustration, don't get me wrong, but I can't honestly say I hate the game anymore. But while I no longer hate Hitman Codename 47 with the burning intensity of a hypergiant star, I also can't honestly say that it's good. It feels like a tech demo, a proof of concept much more than it does a fully realised game. Everything about Codename 47 feels scuffed somehow, and yet upon replaying it I could see what they were aiming for shining through all the garbage. I could see conceptual glimpses of what future games in the series would actually realise, and it was surprising to me. Impressive even because I hadn't noticed them the first time through, even with the benefit of playing with someone who knew the games inside out sitting right beside me. And because of that, in some small way, during my second playthrough I was actually able to have fun. As evidenced by the footage you've seen, Hitman Codename 47 is a feast for connoisseurs of gaming jank. Every system or mechanic in the game is broken to some extent, from the stealth, to the disguises, to the extra lives, to the gunplay. Add to that the fact that there is no save system in the game at all, and that it sometimes plays unfair, and you have the perfect recipe for disaster. But before we get into gameplay, let's talk about presentation. It's a product of its time, but I actually find it quite charming. There's something about the way games looked back in the late 90s and early 2000s that I will always find appealing. The models range from good to Mr. Triangle Face over here, but they all work, and the amount of variety in the NPCs both between and within each location is impressively varied for the time. Likewise, each of the different locations looks distinct and unique. You instantly know when you're in Hong Kong or Colombia or the Netherlands. Even when I was lost as fuck running around in circles, I enjoyed looking around each of the levels. I also really enjoy the way some of the levels are connected to each other. You take out a target outside this restaurant in the second mission, and then return to infiltrate it in the fourth. Likewise, each of the Colombian levels are interconnected by location, so it feels like you're going on a journey through one large area, rather than the game just dropping you into individual sandboxes in which to hit. Men. The story is just set dressing, but it works for what it is. All of the Hitman games have bare-bones plots that only really exist to justify the man-hitting, but some might be surprised to learn just how little story there is here. Aside from these short, mysterious cutscenes between levels and the text-based briefings, it's only really in the last two levels that any sort of plot emerges, and it's over so quickly that it's likely to give the player whiplash. In a paragraph, the plot is this. Agent 47 is the result of a cloning project orchestrated by four crime lords who all donated genetic material to help create him. One of the crime lords, Dr. Ortmeier, is paying the assassination agency that Agent 47 now works for to have the other crime lords killed in order to keep the cloning project to himself. After the other three are dead, he tries to lure Agent 47 into a trap to kill him too, but it fails, and here we are. The plot of the villain paying Agent 47 to deal with their apparently unrelated enemies is surprisingly common across the series. As is Dr. Ortmeier's research into cloning, he casts a long and annoying shadow over the franchise. But like I said before, the plot here is just an excuse, and there's too little of it to give it any real critique. Likewise, there is very little dialogue throughout the game, but more than you might expect. David Bateson, the voice actor of our bathroom-deprived protagonist, claimed he recorded all of his material for Codename 47 in one free to four hour session, and I would absolutely believe that. And while the voice acting, even Bateson's, is, uh... This place is closed today. Too bad. 
I just wanted something to take out. I'm gonna club you like a piñata, dump you in the river, and watch the piranhas rip you apart. When I created you, I was standing on the shoulders of bitches. Sometimes I have a whole brain. Sometimes I have half of a brain. Sometimes I just sing, I want my money. Give it to me. Okay, okay, calm down. Here it is. I bring you your lost idol. White man, you bring back joy into our hearts with the return of Chiyotsulots. This is a woman's dressing room. So obviously you cannot enter with your present sex. But Chef has meat cleaver that could fix your problem. Good day to you, sir. How may I help you? I'm here to pick up a special delivery for Herr Wolf. Let me see. Uh, that's right. Uh, here you are. This place seems quiet. Where do I go for some action? You could try the second floor. Hi, I'm Sandy. What can I do for you? I have this guy watching my car out front. How about treating him to a good time on my account? Now I'm disappointed. I thought you were my date. No. You're not allowed in here. Obviously, you are not invited here, mister. Find another place to hang around. Out of my way, moron. Hello. I have an appointment with Herr Fuchs. Is he in? I'm afraid not. Right now, he is in the thermal bath. You must be the negotiator on behalf of Li Hong, Mr... My name is irrelevant. My aim is to handle this delicate matter to Mr. Hong's satisfaction. Welcome to a den of iniquity. It is our business doing pleasure with you. He's packing! Hello, sir. What can I do for you? I need to use the bathroom. Scuffed. I was surprised at how many variations of different lines there were. Most NPC interactions have one or two variations at least. Take the meeting between Agent 47 and the corrupt police chief in Mission 3. While playing I encountered a bug where the cutscene would repeat every five seconds, even when I was standing in a completely different room of the restaurant. And I got to hear several variations on the exchange. I was personally selected to carry out this delicate mission. It's ironic that being good at the game means you're less likely to hear all of the dialogue, though no amount of skill will save you from Ortmeier's speech. The sound design is good at least. I don't really have anything to say about it. And as for the music, well, uh, I like the Colombian theme. And the Rotterdam theme is burned into my memory like the screams of the damned. Otherwise it all pretty much faded into the background for me. It's nothing to write home about, but it's functional. While I do enjoy the game's presentation, its representation leaves a lot to be desired. The game leans surprisingly hard into colonial stereotypes in Hong Kong and Colombia. There's an exotic Asian sex slave for 47 to liberate from the evil Fu Manchu-esque Li Hong. The line, I would like to sample some of Asia's finest delicacies, is played completely straight. I mean, about the only thing missing is a park with a sign saying no dogs or Chinese. There's an indigenous village being menaced by Duncachino's drug operation in Colombia in need of a white saviour to not only recover their sacred idol, but rescue their chief's brother and 47 just happens to fit the bill. I mean, this cutscene speaks for itself. I'd like to say that gaming has moved on from these racist depictions of Asia and South America, but games like Ghost Recon Wildlands prove that isn't the case. I wrote in an earlier draft of this script that this cutscene should have, even in 2000, raised some red flags, but apparently we're not quite there yet. The way the game treats women is pretty crap too. There aren't many, but all save for Diana and generic NPCs are either sex objects, stereotypes, or figures to be ridiculed. The one exception maybe being that Lee Hong has female guards, which is surprisingly progressive for a guy who owns literal sex slaves. And as for Diana, she doesn't exist outside of the briefing texts and doesn't even have a voice here. This is a general problem that exists in many of the Hitman games in my opinion, but as bad as Codename 47 is about its treatment of women, at least it's not as bad as Absolution. Still, it's a very immature depiction of women and the wider world at large, and I felt it would be remiss of me not to mention it. Moving on now to gameplay, like I said before, every system in the game is to some extent broken. Let's start with what everyone watching this will no doubt agree is the most important game mechanic in a stealth game, the combat. 
The target reticule is often more of a suggestion of where the bullet will go rather than a definite indication. With the exceptions of the sniper rifle, which was generally reliable, and anything with a high enough fire rate to make precise aiming irrelevant, every gun I used had this problem. Whether running and gunning or standing dead still to line up the perfect shot, sometimes the bullets would just decide no. I must be free. Because of this, 47 swings wildly between a Master Assassin and a Stormtrooper, and this honestly baffles me given I believe Codename 47 was originally meant to be an action game. What might surprise you is that I don't actually think this is jank. I think this is working as intended because the game actually has two aiming systems. The reticule locked to center aiming most people will exclusively use, and lean aiming. As shown throughout the recap portion of this video, leaning to one side or another unlocks the reticule from the center of the screen and gives you complete mouse control over targeting your weapon. Time and again I found lean aiming to be pixel perfect accurate when compared to normal aiming. Any time I missed I could generally put the fault at my feet rather than the games. Except with the shotgun. Fuck this shotgun, it sucks. But while I don't believe the interaction between these two systems to be jank, the fact that the game never tells you about lean aiming absolutely is. Unless you happen to lean while holding a weapon, and why would you when it is extremely illegal in most situations, you would never know you could unlock the reticule and mouse aim by doing so. It doesn't even really tell you in the manual either, the most it says is that it's quote, good for shooting around corners, end quote. That's it. No indication that it's actually more accurate. There is someone out there who has finished Codename 47 without ever realising you could do this, and my heart goes out to them. Even then, lean aiming is basically useless in most combat scenarios because it limits your movement. You need time to line up a shot, time you will not have when getting golf ball sized holes blown through you by every weapon toting NPC within 20 roods. Yes, roods. A rood is an old unit of measurement, but I don't remember what distance it covers. Much like Codename 47 doesn't understand how health works. Call me Litman because these segways are on fire. Even with armor, Agent 47 is a fragile little baby. Or he's a tank who can stand in the middle of a street getting shot at by 20 guys and only be mildly inconvenienced. His constitution seems to fluctuate with his mood and the armor can sometimes quite literally do nothing. This is because the game actually has a surprisingly complex damage system that it doesn't tell you about. It is body shots and as the manual very briefly describes only body shots that will have damage tanked by armor if 47 is wearing any. Even if he's not, there's a lot of meat for the bullets to get lost in, so he's generally good to survive one or two. Headshots, if they aren't an instant kill, will severely reduce health while bypassing armor entirely, as, I think, will leg and foot damage, which is how these dogs in Rotterdam can eat 47's feet meat without ever taking off a point of armor. If you take into account how different weapons do different amounts of damage too, the end result is a system that can feel pretty arbitrary, since the health bar is ultimately useless in gauging how close to death you are. The only real solution is to just not get hit, lol. Weirdly, everything I've just spoken about also applies to the game's NPCs. Damage does seem dependent on where you shoot them, with headshots doing loads of damage and body shots merely tickling them. It seems likely given the tankiness of some of the enemies that they have armor too, but like so many other things in the game it doesn't tell you that. You can empty entire weapons into single enemies without downing them, but get a lucky headshot and drop them just like that. Or maybe not, as this ship captain took two hits to the head from a desert eagle to drop. And you better pray you don't get into a firefight with a group because each and every NPC around you will lock onto you like a shark tasting blood and turn 47 into Swiss cheese. And unlike 47 himself, the enemies are generally pretty good shots. As you can imagine, this makes the two combat focused segments of the game difficult. The optional boss fight with Dunkachino and the final battle against the 48s are made next to impossible by how janky ass broken the combat system is. The easiest way to beat them both is by finding a place you can camp and easily lean aim the bastards to death. It's a weird tradition that many of the Hitman games follow in having the final level be a combat focused rush of enemies rather than one final stealth based mission. I get the intent to allow the player to let loose and have some fun after surmounting the previous challenges, but it just rings hollow to me. The sudden swerve in mechanical focus at the very end is not a catharsis as the developers clearly intended, but a demand that the player learn a new way to play the game. For a player who prefers stealth to combat, and who may have got through the game on the merits of their skills in the former, the sudden requirement for competency in the latter just feels unfair. And this isn't even me making assumptions, I actually completed Meet Your Brothers before my Hitman Obsessed friend did. 
His preference for stealth meant learning the ins and outs of the game's broken combat system in a level where you're expected to fight constantly spawning enemies who beeline straight to you. The moment they start moving just wasn't worth it. And I don't blame him. The level is set up like this game of cat and mouse with a maze-like layout and lots of hidden weapons like this bad boy, but the execution is rotten. Not only do the 48s run you down so fast you barely get the chance to look around, but unlike just about every other level in the game, you're not given the chance to buy weapons or armor beforehand, and just about everything you bring in from the previous level, which also denies you the opportunity to buy weapons or armor beforehand, vanishes from your inventory between loading screens. I don't know how you're expected to complete this level without camping in a corner and shooting the 48s the second they glitch through a door beside you and start blasting. It's the method I used in both playthroughs, and the method my friend used to finally complete the level too. Even if you run and get the minigun in time, I feel like you're still just expected to stand in place and let the 48s melt in front of your bullets. The boss fight with Dunkachino is made only slightly better by the fact that it's optional, but the only viable way to fight him is still to just stand at the door taking pot shots. Much more frustrating about this fight is that he stops to banter every time you shoot him, and he has so much health from that snort of super cocaine that you're going to be shooting him a lot. I'm stronger than you, amigo. I feel no pain. Don't you have anything bigger, maricon? Come on, show me you got cojones. Looking briefly at the weapons, there is a decent variety to be found in the game, but the only three you'll ever really need is the silenced pistol, the sniper rifle, and something with a high fire rate like the AK-47. You can buy a ton of different weapons before missions and find even more inside the levels themselves, but they're also unnecessary, and the only level where they would be useful is the one level you can't buy them. The weapon variety feels like a holdover from when the game was still action-oriented. In a stealth game, it just seems out of place. In fact, overall the combat just comes across as unbalanced and arbitrary, with the obvious intention of pushing the player towards stealth. But the problem with that is that the stealth system is equally as broken as the combat. One of the most frustrating aspects of my first playthrough while being guided through the game by my friend was that he insisted I walk everywhere because he claimed running would cause the guards to get suspicious. And it does but only when the game feels like it. I spent most of my playthrough for this video running around like a headless chicken and nobody cared. I can think of only three occasions in the entire game when running actually made NPCs suspicious of me. Sometimes it didn't seem to matter. I could be sneaking, or standing still, or going for a nice stroll, and enemies would just suddenly know I was there to hit a man and open fire. In fact, enemy awareness in general when it comes to stealth in Codename 47 is absolutely bonkers. Sometimes it's like they're hyper-aware, and other times it's like they're blind, but the worst part is it's not consistent. You can play a level the exact same way multiple times and somehow, somehow, get different results. I think the best example of this in my playthrough is the guy from Gunrunner's Paradise, who I talked about before. Somehow he saw me shooting the dogs outside the warehouse toward the end of the level and attacked me. With his pathfinding unable to follow me through the broken fence into the warehouse, I abandoned him and went inside to continue the level. Fast forward a few minutes to the end of the mission, and as the Mad Hatter here goes to leave, the guy from before notices me and starts blasting. He is so far away that I can't even see him through the draw distance, but because he opened fire, I failed the mission. In the debriefing, both objectives were listed as accomplished, but somehow I still lost. And if this image doesn't sum up Codename 47, I don't know what does. I got a similar screen in one of my many attempts at Dunkachino's stronghold. The thing is, I never found this guy again on repeat playthroughs. And I looked. I don't know where he came from, whether he patrols the level or just happened to be standing somewhere nearby, but I never found him again, and it never happened again. But because one time this guy happened to recognise the sound of a dog getting shot in the head from 10 miles away, I had to redo the entire level. Other times, like this guy in Say Hello to My Little Friend only sometimes noticing I'd killed his buddy, can be chalked up to me being too slow to drag the body out of the room before he ran down to check. But not this guy psychically becoming aware of the bodies hidden in the next room the instant I open a door. It's not like he's even looking in the right direction either, he just suddenly knows the bodies are there. But these guys in Find the Ewer Tribe don't even notice their friend getting murdered right behind them like one of those dudes who ran into the long grass in the Lost World Jurassic Park. If you'll allow me a brief tangent, back when I was a teenager I tried my hand at game making. I started work on what was basically a 2D interpretation of Resident Evil. I didn't get very far into the game, in fact I never made it past a short demo. The artwork was suitably amateur, but it functioned and I'm proud of it for what it is. But the reason I'm bringing this up now is because of the way I was able to program a very crude AI for the enemy zombies. Each zombie was paired with a big invisible circle that stayed with them at all times. If the player wasn't inside the circle, the zombie was programmed to maybe take a step right, maybe take a step left, maybe just stand still for a bit and have a think. But if the player entered the circle, then it was brain munching time. And I'll be damned if enemy awareness in Codename 47 doesn't function in the exact same way, with one notable difference. If you do anything incriminating within their big invisible awareness circle, 
That's it. Kill a man, shoot a dog, open a door to a room containing a body, run, but only sometimes. Hold a weapon, but only sometimes. Wear the wrong clothes, and you're done. The difference between my abandoned game and Codename 47 is that in Codename 47 enemy awareness spreads. Accidentally alerting an enemy can send a level attempt down an irrevocable chaos spiral where more and more guards will come running, alerting even more guards, until there's nothing to do but restart. You can get caught by one group of guards and be completely unknown to another group nearby despite the fact they're close enough to have heard the shots by the game's own internal logic. If you stand next to a clothed corpse without holding a weapon, guards won't consider you suspicious. Take this moment when some cops found me trying to hide a body, or better yet, the assassination of Lee Hong in the Lee Hong assassination. This is an enclosed space crawling with guards, some of whom have a direct view into the room. There is no one else who could have possibly killed him. But because I used a silenced weapon and I managed to holster it in time, I was not considered considered suspicious, and it only gets worse from there. The disguise system is simply broken. Not in the janky sense, but in the sense that it is just outright non-functional. There was clearly meant to be a suspicion system as evidenced by the alerts in the top left here, where the more conspicuous actions you made the less the disguise would work, but it doesn't function that way. It's not a spectrum, it's a binary system where NPCs either know you're a hitman, or they don't. There is no in-between. If an NPC doesn't know you're a hitman after you've been compromised, it's because you weren't close enough to be part of their big awareness circle when you were discovered. And in a lot of levels it's a safe bet you won't be. Level design in Codename 47 comes in two flavours, Maze and Empty. Once or twice these two flavours even combine in a pairing easily comparable to orange juice and toothpaste. The only exception to this rule is the opening tutorial, which is a linear arrangement of corridors as I already said. Let's start with the mazes. These levels tend to be missions set indoors, but even the early outdoor Hong Kong levels tend toward being maze-like with their many identical alleyways that crisscross the city blocks around what is generally a unique structure. When let loose inside a building such as the Li Hong assassination traditions of the trade or the setup, it is instead endless rows of identical rooms along identical corridors that is the problem. All the extra space in these levels doesn't seem to serve a purpose other than to disorient the player. If you know where you're going, you generally won't even see more than half of any given map. Occasionally you can find extra ammo or armor tucked away in a very out of the way room, but it's usually so far away from where you're supposed to be, it's not worth the effort of finding it in the first place, and if I have to say away one more time in a single sentence, I'm going to scream. The fact that outright combat is in no way a viable option for all but the final mission make these extra ammo drops effectively worthless too, because at no point are you going to need them. The money you make from each mission will ensure you can buy more ammo than you'll actually need before the level even starts, and since the cash stacks between missions, by the end of the game you're going to be swimming in ammo, even if you do get money deducted for killing non-targets. With the big outdoor maps it's the opposite problem. You can know exactly where you're supposed to go, but it'll still take you a million years to get there because the levels are so ridiculously big. Add to that the fact there's rarely anything interesting to find in all that empty space, and it's just a boring slog to run through, especially on repeat attempts. And even then, I still often got lost despite the help of a map and a compass because the draw distance is the length of Agent 47's hair and everything looks the same. You might be able to know at a glance whether you're in Hong Kong, Colombia, Hungary, the Netherlands, or Romania, even down to the individual level, but finding yourself within those individual levels can sometimes be impossible. It's all too big and too empty and too similar, to the point where I mostly stumbled my way to victory 90% of the time. Let's talk about the biggest levels in the game. Find the Ewer Tribe and the perforated apps as some people know as plutonium runs loose, both of which are maze-like and empty in their own way. In the case of Find the Ewer Tribe, this is impressive since there are no actual walls or corridors to get lost in. The level is just so big and covered with so many identical trees that it's impossible not to lose your way, even if you sort of know where you're going. You're given no real direction of where to go, so it's usually impossible to tell you're headed the right way until you've found what you're looking for. I'm not even sure the crash site where you find the idol is on the map. I just stumbled onto it after following a pointing statue, thinking it would lead me to the village. Is this it? I went back and played the level again to check, but couldn't find it. If so, then this one's on me. Regardless, this level is huge, empty, confusing, and made even worse by the fact two of your objectives are at complete opposite ends of the map. While there is a river to follow that makes navigating between them slightly easier, it takes so long to run the distance that it just becomes tedious. But not as tedious as this fresh cancer. Plutonium Runs Loose starts out as a big empty dockyard filled with guards and dogs that you are forced to take at a specific, sometimes very slow pace, before transitioning to a maze as soon as you get onto the boat. The maze is not as bad as, say, the setup, but it is easy to get turned around once on board. Add to that a time limit once you pass a certain point in the level, on top of all the other jank I've already discussed regarding stealth and combat, and you can easily see why this is regarded by fans of the series as one of, if not the single worst mission in the 
franchise. You can see here my panic in trying to find the engine room before the nuke goes off the one time I actually managed to get that far without crashing. It takes so long to get through the first half of the level to the boat that having to do so multiple times after dying to some janky twitch of the combat or stealth systems is one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had with a video game. The thing is, so much of my frustration with Codename 47 would be greatly mitigated with the addition of one simple thing. A save system. As stated before, Codename 47 does not have any sort of manual save, autosave, or checkpoint system to speak of. At most you can say it has a kind of bizarre respawn system that I'll explain in a moment. But first I want to note that I truly do not understand the thought process behind not including any kind of checkpoint or save system. It's baffling to me. In a game built around trial and error, the absence of such a system de-emphasizes the risk-reward of trial and exacerbates the punishment of error, especially in the longer levels like Plutonium. As for the respawn system, if it's here as a substitute for a proper save system, it's a poor one. Aside from that one time in Find the Ewer Tribe where it actually helped me beat the level, it's almost always better to just restart. As you may have noticed through the recap section of this video, it doesn't actually reset enemy awareness, only 47's health. They're still just going to shoot you again the second you step into their line of sight, and according to the manual, respawning costs $3,000 better spent on ammo anyway. I believe there was once a save system included at some point in the game's development, and the fact that they allegedly removed it because it otherwise made the game too short is one of the worst decisions I think IO Interactive has ever made. And while it is true that the absence of a save system does lengthen the overall playtime, it instantly smothers any replay value the game might have had too. Because some of these levels were clearly crafted with the intention of repeat playthroughs. I never noticed this on my first playthrough with my friend because he was always guiding me through the generally accepted level route, but when I played the game again by myself for this video I was surprised to find just how much the game accounts for different paths through each mission, and sometimes multiple missions. Consider the Jungle God. I have never completed this level as the devs intended because it was easier just to run right past that big old pussy straight to the level exit. You're expected to lure a boar over to distract the cat so you can sneak past, but you don't have to. And why would you when and this is so much easier. The following level, Say Hello to My Little Friend, actually has two viable routes, but the easier one requires setup levels in advance, something I don't think I've seen in any other Hitman game to date. If you get the sniper rifle off this tower boy and find the Ewer tribe and carry it through the jungle god into Say Hello to My Little Friend, you can shoot Dunkachino from practically the starting position of the level and bypass the boss fight with him entirely, but this route is locked off if you don't bring the weapon across all three Colombian levels. I myself locked out into this option during my playthrough since I just never bothered to drop the sniper rifle. According to my friend, the guards are meant to turn on you when they see you with a sniper rifle, and in every other instance they did, but in my playthrough of Jungle God they just didn't care. I don't understand this game. In Traditions of the Trade you can kill Dr. Fuchs in the sauna, or on his walk through the hotel, or if you feel like it you can go get this shotgun from the florist and go buck wild on everyone in the building. Given how terrible the combat is in this game, I have to wonder why acquiring the shotgun is even an option, because there's no chance you'd ever get away with playing the level with this method. But that's the thing, you could try if you really want. The option is there if you believe. This attention to detail is something I would expect much more of the later games, not Codename 47. Even Plutonium Runs Loose, the objectively worst level in all video games, has two possible completion routes. You can go the more combat focused route of getting the car bomb and storming the boat like I did, or you can sneak aboard and murder Boris without ever giving him the chance to start the countdown on the nuke before killing every last person aboard. I never took this route even though it actually might be easier because I stubbornly wanted to see Boris's car explode with him inside it, but the fact that this option exists is noteworthy. I was genuinely surprised at how many options the game gave me, given from my first playthrough I had long believed the game to be quite rigid in how it wanted you to complete each level. This is a belief my Hitman obsessed friend held too, and I have to wonder if that's true of most people who play this game as well, that because this game is so punishing in so many ways the exploration and trial and error needed to discover these different options isn't seen as worth it by most players. True, it's nowhere near as many options per level as the World of Assassination trilogy, or even Silent Assassin, but the fact that they're present at all in Codename 47 is more than I originally gave the game credit for. Likewise, I can't help but feel the sheer size of the levels is meant to encourage exploration, but because of the game's high difficulty most players will resort to a guide rather than suffer through the game's bullshit. Which I think is honestly a shame, because some of the levels are quite well choreographed in terms of guiding the player to the solution through info in the briefing and contextual clues inside the levels themselves. 
Ambush at Wang Fu Restaurant and Traditions of the Trade do this really well in different ways. Ambush gives you a car bomb from the outset, and a player watching the limo closely will notice the driver sneak away to take a piss in the gutter. It's not hard to put two and two together, and the rest flows freely from there. Traditions of the Trade is very good at giving you clues to follow at the front desk, and you can be outright told where your target is by his secretary if you go and ask her. But I think the best example in the game is the Li Hong assassination. The way the mission is laid out as a level means if you follow the optimal path, you don't actually have to do that much backtracking. The bar leads to the brothel, leads to the roof, leads to the kitchen, leads to Mr. America, leads to the safes, leads to the restaurant, leads to the kitchen, leads to the tunnels, leads to Li Hong's hideout, leads to the level exit. It takes a long time, sure, but it's a lot smoother than the giant maze-like map of the level might indicate at first glance. Even Plutonium Runs Loose, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, throws you a bone by telling you in the briefing where to find the car bomb with which to explode Boris. There are some exceptions to this, like in Gunrunner's Paradise, where I don't know how you're expected to know you need to use the train to smash through a fence, or that you need to keep this guy at the strip club alive so he can guide you to the weapons deal. But for the most part, the levels give you a generally good starting point from which to figure out what you're meant to do. Of course, this careful choreographing of the levels is offset by the pyroclastic clouds of jank that hang over this game, but I have saved the absolute worst offence code. 47 commits for last. Because even with all its broken, bullshit, arbitrary game systems and the egregious lack of any kind of save system, Codename 47 still has the audacity to play dirty by having pre-programmed traps for first-time players. These are things you couldn't possibly be expected to know your first time through, but the game will absolutely punish you for not knowing them anyway. A lot of them I've already mentioned before, but just to recap, in the Li Hong assassination, 47 kills Zun with a gun in a cutscene, which is fine, but when the cutscene ends, you regain control with the gun still in hand, and if you don't notice fast enough to holster it before the guards come running to investigate, that's it, you're done. Enjoy playing through the level again, dingus. I've already gone into detail on the traps in Plutonium, this guy, the roof lords, and the asshole in the engine room. Even the final level has not one, but two of these traps, both within the last few seconds of the game. If you try and enter Ortmeier's lab without scanning a dead 48 at the door, you can look forward to playing the level through again. This is sort of indicated by a cutscene earlier in the level, but I'd be surprised if more than a handful of players actually remain mindful of that moment given how much concentration is required to get through the fight. The final player trap is Ortmeier himself. He can actually kill you if you let him get too close while he's monologuing. It all just comes across as spiteful, and even if the rest of the game wasn't a flaming train wreck, I'd still think this aspect of it was bullshit. If I had to sum up my thoughts about Hitman Code Name 47, I'd say I've found a sort of grudging respect for the game that wasn't there before. In playing through it again and examining its systems in close critique, I found there is actually genuine fun to be had and genuine praise to be given. I was surprised to find how much the World of Assassination trilogy actually owes to this game, and not just in terms of story. I can see now what IO Interactive were aiming for, even 20 years ago, but intent and vision do not a good game make. Raising the bar from absolute zero still doesn't leave you with anything spectacular. This is not a hidden gem or an underrated classic, and to answer the question in the video's title, does Hitman Code Name 47 hold up? In a word, no. Is Hitman Code Name 47 worth playing? At this point? No. Later titles in the Hitman series do everything this game does better, and there are many other stealth games besides that run rings around Codename 47, even ones that predate this title. If the World of Assassination trilogy has got you curious about the classic Hitman games, I would suggest you start with Silent Assassin or Codename 47 pseudo-remake contracts. Both those games have their own issues, but they're much easier to pick up and play than this first title. Hitman Codename 47 may no longer be one of the worst games I've ever played, but it is certainly one of the most frustrating. I'm glad I made the effort to give it another chance, but I am never going to play it again. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to use the bathroom. Thanks for watching. Hey, I review books really quickly over on this channel. Check it out if that sounds like your thing. Check it out if it doesn't sound like your thing. Just check it out, I'm telling you to check it out. Um... 47? 47, what are you doing? Don't you think that's going to be a little bit suspicious? Just standing there staring at the car. Oh no! Ah!